Kathy. So thank you so much to all of our viewers who are joining us today, whether you're joining from Zoom or Facebook Live, whether you're watching it now or at a recorded um, time later, we thank you so much um, for all of your support. Um, and, and watching our webinars, sharing our webinars. So many of you have sent in ideas about topics and guests that we should host. Um, so this truly has been such a team effort. Um, thank you so much for always, always um, standing by MPAC and, and our mission. To speak slightly about our mission tonight, I wanna talk about the work that MPAC does. You know, a lot of what we do revolves around engaging with our communities, engaging with our government, engaging with our media to help a public understanding of Muslim Americans. Now, I could tell you that, I could tell you all the things that I do on a daily basis, but that's not the only way to make an impact. Our impact comes from people like you, helping out, supporting our organization. Anytime that you feel that I can do more, send us an email, hello at mpac.org, and we'd love to work with you. So today I'm gonna to get right into it. We have a phenomenal, phenomenal guest from the Interfaith Alliance, Rabbi Jack Moline. Um, Rabbi Jack Moline and Salam are, are good pals. So, so I will not take up too much time, um, but uh, Rabbi Moline is president of the Interfaith Alliance and he is also the Rabbi Emeritus of Agudas Aikim Congregation in Alexandria, Virginia, where he served in the pulpit for 27 years. He is an adjunct faculty member of the Jewish Theological Seminary in Virginia and Virginia Theological Seminary. He served as co-chair of the Virginia Commission on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Inclusion appointed by Governor Terry McAuliffe after the Charlottesville incident. So I'm not gonna take a moment more. I'm gonna let Salam al Mariyadi, our president and visionary here at MPAC, take the lead. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and uh, welcome, Jack. And since we're Thank two you, pals, it's great to be here. Yeah, since we're two pals, I don't know if we need to get into <laughs> much of the pleasantries in the introduction, but good to have you with us. Do you and, remember when we met, by the way? Uh, it's must like, like 25 years ago. Yeah, it was at the uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1996. That's it was right. A long time ago. And that was Clinton's second. Correct. His second convention. Correct. And of all places, the first place we met was at the APAC reception. <laughs> uh, M. Zogby had brought you there to see what they were doing. And right. you just took off after that. Yeah. <laughs> Not much there. I already knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you stick around much? Uh, at the APAC uh, yeah. thing? No, actually, that night I went to the, re the, uh, Arab the Arab American Democrats reception and walked through the crowd wearing my uh, yarmulke, my kippah. And uh, my wife kept saying, they're looking at you. And I said, that's why I'm here. So they'll yeah. see me. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I remember there were times back in the 90s when we would invite Jewish leaders to the mosque and we would be invited to synagogues. It was like that. It was, it was yep. tense because it was so abnormal. Now, I think it's like, hey, you know, we're, we're neighbors, we're relatives, we're cousins, we're, we're people of the same uh, Abrahamic faiths. So, it, you know, we, we've come a long way since then. We sure have. Yeah, and I think th those few steps that we took to break those barriers were important. Um, and, and I'm really glad to have you as a partner and, a, and as a friend. So thank you for joining it's us. It's always a pleasure. So tell us, um, you know, you're president of the Interfaith Alliance. That is a, a very uh, Im important and impressive uh, coalition of faith partners. And if you can just tell us a little bit about the work that the Alliance is doing right now. Sure. Our, uh, our basic mission is contained in our motto, protecting faith and freedom. So what a lot of our partners do, either from a, a single uh, faith or denominational perspective, or from a strictly constitutional perspective, we have a larger umbrella uh, and therefore a slightly larger mission, which is to protect both of the religion clauses that are the first freedoms in the First Amendment, the freedom of conscience and uh, the prevention of the government from interfering in religious life and religious uh, life from interfering in the workings of government. So we do that in, in three ways. First of all, uh, and probably most importantly, we're an educational 
institution. We try to educate our members and public figures about the importance of true religious freedom. Uh, secondly, we are advocates for uh, wise and fair policy, particularly as it relates to people of faith and particularly people of minority faiths in the United States. And uh, thirdly, we're an, uh, an organization that uh, clocks in with the government to make sure that policies that are developed uh, are not discriminatory against minorities in particular and, uh, and against religion in general. Well, I mean, I, you know, as far as protecting faith and freedom, so many times we hear the term religious freedom and it comes off as something that is actually violating um, uh, people's rights uh, to practice as they see fit. And it's usually done in the name of religion. So you know, it's, it's awful. I, and, and how does the Interfaith Alliance address that problem? Uh, we have been talking about true religious freedom for the 25 years or more that we've been in existence, uh, Salam. And um, a lot of our partners have tried to urge us to give up the talk about religious freedom and religious liberty, particularly because of what you just mentioned, that the religious right has tried to weaponize those words and turn them into a license to discriminate. Uh, we refuse to give that up. We won't uh, cede that ground to them because uh, the minute that we begin to equate religious freedom, religious liberty, with uh, permission from the government to exclude others on the basis of their faith, we've really given up America and we refuse to do that. And I, and I believe we've given up on the essence of our faiths because that's the purpose uh, of uh, our Abrahamic faiths is to give people the freedom to choose uh, how to worship, when to worship as they see fit. Look, it's, it's undeniable that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have teachings that are exclusionary. If they didn't, there would be no distinction among them. But the essence of that is that we are all one human family, that we were all created to be brothers and sisters uh, under, under the fatherhood and the motherhood of, uh, of Abraham and Hagar and Sarah. And uh, that's, that's the only way we're going to survive in a global society, and it is the basis on which our founders uh, came up with the American idea. Now, talking about our, our faiths, um, you're, you celebrated uh, Passover last week. We're ready to enter Ramadan next week, so we're at that midpoint between the two. Right. Um, how are you seeing faith-based communities readjusting uh, their upcoming holidays and religious services in light of COVID-19? You know, it's really, uh, it's really something. My, my wife and I have been privileged over the years to host on the first night of Passover, a Seder, a ritual meal, to which we have 30 or 35 members of our family and our close friends. This year, of course, that was impossible. At our Seder, it was just my wife and me at the table. That's the smallest Seder I ever conducted. On the other hand, we opened our Seder to members of our community here in Virginia, and we had close to 100 people which was the largest Seder I ever conducted, though I conducted it over Zoom, like you and I are talking now. And that's, that's a lot of what's going on. The spirit of community is meeting the spirit of innovation. And people are coming together as they should, uh, observing the, the new norms of social distancing during this crisis. There are people who are resisting that. And my, uh, my concern for them is even greater than my anger at them. Uh, when they come together in violation of these dist distancing policies and, uh, and wise practice in a pandemic like this, they're endangering themselves and they're endangering me, which, uh, which doesn't make me happy. But uh, I, I don't want to be consoling them uh, because of their, of their mistaken uh, approach to all of this not because I won't console them, I just don't wanna be in that position of having to say to them, I feel badly for you because you didn't listen. But um, theoretically though, uh, there were some people, for example, that were commemorating Easter and they had a large gathering in their churches. They did. Are, are we supposed to defend them and their freedom of religion? 
You know, my, my predecessor at Interfaith Alliance is, is a wonderful friend of mine and of yours named Welton Gaddy. And uh, the, the very first week of this uh, uh, shut-in, um, Interfaith Alliance began a, a, a webcast similar to this, and he was my very first guest. And I kept saying to him, Welton, what do you think? If people gather in violation of these orders to close down, should the, should the gatherings be disrupted and, and, and uh, broken up by government authorities? And he, he was hemming and hawing, and I said, come on, you got to take a stand. And he said, Jack, holy doesn't mean stupid, <laughs> which I thought was a great line. And uh, so people should not be doing that. You know, it, just because they affirm it's their constitutional right doesn't mean that that one particular right overrides the global interests of the public and public health and of the Constitution. We modify those First Amendment rights all the time when situations call for them. Um, we have a freedom of speech, but you're not allowed to shout fire in a crowded theater. We have a freedom of assembly, but when gathering in large numbers uh, creates a, a public safety hazard, the authorities have the right to make sure that everybody, including those who gather, are safe. And we have freedom of religion, but freedom of religion does not mean an exemption from the restrictions of the laws uh, of the United States uh, that are placed on all of us. You know, there's been severe backlash against Asian Americans and uh, a rise in hate crimes and um, a continuing rise of hate crimes against the Jewish community and the Muslim community. How do you see that uh, being addressed by our groups collectively in, in terms of uh, hate in, in this current environment, especially when it comes to social media? You, you see much more of it now than ever before. Yeah, you know, it is, it is the blessing and the curse of the global community we live in that we have all of this communication. The global community is also what's responsible for the ease with which uh, this COVID-19 virus has spread because we have so much direct contact with each other, things that our ancestors couldn't have imagined if they, if they wanted to. Um, the answer to this discrimination is the same as it's always been. Uh, those of us who are allies have to stand with our partners when they suffer. And more importantly than just standing with them, we have to take our lead from them. It's not up to the Jewish community to, uh, to dictate what the response ought to be to discrimination in the Asian community. The Asians can't get to say what it means to, uh, to be fair to Muslims, and the Muslims don't get to say what it means to be fair to Jews. When you call on me, Salam, because there's something going on in the Muslim community, I'm your ally. I need to stand there with you half a step behind. And that's what we have to all do for the Asian community right now, because they are being uh, dog whistled by the president. And uh, that's going to, uh, it's going to come back to haunt us down the road. You know, we, we've developed a human security campaign, which is talking about security as uh, the rights of civilian populations, as opposed to national security, which is the, uh, the security of the state uh, merely the state, uh, not civilians. And so part of our campaign is to work uh, for empowering local community health clinics. And, and within community health clinics, you have that trust with communities so that if you need vaccinations, if you need testing, it can be done through them. Um, and you put aside the, the, the problem of mistrust of government, especially of the federal government. Um, and then you also have the need to uh, pr uh, provide more resources for vulnerable communities, which are usually minorities who live in um, uh, dense uh, uh, urban centers. Um, and so how do you see us moving forward in advocating uh, for those uh, platforms? And I know the Interfaith Alliance has done that. As you said, um, the Interfaith Alliance works on wise and fair policy and, and against discrimination. In this era, it seems like that discrimination is coming out, first of all, in terms of fatalities, disproportionate number of fatalities in minority communities. Then in lack of testing, you, uh, celebrities 
those at a higher socioeconomic status are going to have more access to testing than uh, others. And then finally, those who are essential workers, again, comprising mainly of minorities and the poor, because they have no, they have no means of uh, sustaining themselves otherwise. How do you see us moving forward in dealing with, with, it, with this complex problem? There needs to be a change of heart among the people of the United States, and particularly those who are divided across this uh, increasingly wide economic gap uh, that exists among us. I, I think one of the values of faith, to be honest with you, is that because it teaches the equality of all people, because it, it demands that we treat the rich and the poor with the same set of values, it can help to motivate this. But we have to have a change of heart and not allow a privileged class in the United States, and I have to say, mostly I'm part of that privileged class, to assume that they have a right to scarce resources or that they have a right not to advocate for broader resources because I've got mine and everybody else will just sort of get along as, as they have to. Um, we need uh, not just to have that change of heart within our communities, we need a leadership in this country that takes that approach, that does not say we have an interest that is greater than the preservation of human life and therefore, there are some lives that are expendable. I have been absolutely horrified to be reading from people in uh, what I can only call the, the conservative press. Uh, I've been horrified to read that they're, they're suggesting that there's an acceptable level of human loss uh, in order to get our economy moving again. I, and, and they use, I think, the specious argument um, that they've poo-pooed when it's used for them in terms of advocating for policy, that poverty kills too. And so if our economy has a downturn, more people are going to die and therefore better they should die sooner and we should get our economy up and running again than they should die later from underemployment and, uh, and uh, food scarcity and, and the like. I, it's just nonsense. Everybody who's writing this is someone who has money in the bank and food in the larder. And uh, we just, we need wiser voices guiding us. Well, let's hopefully we take those voices from Moses and Muhammad and, and work towards that. Um, uh, we, 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 need, we, need, we need clarity and we need wisdom uh, at this time more than ever. And, and it's the wisdom that, that faith traditions bring to the secular courtyard of the United States. We're, we're not going to resolve this by the Constitution alone, but the Constitution has to be the rubric by which all of these different points of view are considered in the great marketplace of ideas. Um, I'm going to let Iman uh, moderate the Q&A you know, after a few minutes. But uh, before we do that, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Two more questions. Um, we have found that white supremacist violence in this country now has surpassed ISIS-related violence. And, um, and, and, and so we, we have a, you know, I, I was part of a task force that was working on recommending policies to the Department of Homeland Security on dealing with that and how we can secure houses of worship. There's money for synagogues and mosques and churches to enhance their security, but that is only part of the solution. What, what do you see as, as really the, the approach we should take together in confronting this violent danger to all our houses of worship? Um, well, I'll start by saying I don't think it's a recent thing that white supremacist terrorism has surpassed uh, uh, foreign motivated terrorism in this country. Um, you and I are both old enough to remember the rise of the militias in rural areas, particularly in the, in the North and the Northwest in the United States. And, and the, the offspring of those militias, whether they're the, the genetic offspring or the ideological offspring, are the people who are now populating these white supremacist groups. This has been a problem in the United States for a long time. Timothy McVeigh was part of that, uh, was part of that uh, surge of, of white supremacist terrorism. So the first thing we need to do is to be able to call it for what it is and, and to make it a priority in government to root out and, uh, 
and uh, find a way to uh, to either imprison or re-educate the people who are proposing it. It it sounds like an unpopular thing, mostly to white people, but I have to say this is what uh, we've been doing to minorities in this country, whether they're minorities of race or minorities of faith, for a long time. And um, all it does is embolden uh, the white supremacists. So uh, we have to stand together in demanding this from the government, and we need to have a government that's responsive to that. You know, I what, one of the misconceptions that people have is that all evangelicals are one group, but I think even within the evangelical community, you have people like Jim Wallace, you have uh, publications like Christianity Today. I think those are the people that we should be engaging more to work together on, uh, on that common agenda, to work as, as one whole as opposed to separate uh, groups uh, against that threat. I think there are Christians of, of every denomination, of every perspective, who are strong allies in this effort. Uh, what we're up against is, uh, is a cultural phenomenon of, of the megachurch that provides a, a megaphone for pastors who are frankly preaching perversions of Christianity, in my opinion, um, and uh, allowing them the opportunity to suggest that there are greater and lesser people in this country or that there is an authority that supersedes the Constitution. Uh, that is far from the majority of the evangelicals. Most evangelicals are, like most Muslims and most Jews, faithful Americans who understand the appropriate place of their faith in, in a constitutional society. Thank you, Jack. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna let Iman take it from here, and uh, I believe we have a few questions for you from the audience. Please. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, Robin, I mean, just to begin, um, I think one of the one of the questions in the chat starts with, you know, the times that we're living in, the administration that we currently have in place. Um, how do you recommend to overcome some of the distrust and the disinformation that is constantly spewing from from the White House in getting many communities of faith, getting the, um, you know, uh, uh, sanction or the, the, the distaste of white supremacy once again to, to be, you know, the, the norm? What, what, what can we do as, as, a, as a group to, to make that happen again? I think the most important thing in these times is to keep our eyes on the prize. If we elect to create a public agenda for our, our nation or even for our faith communities that is reactive to the bad behavior that's coming from uh, the administration, then we're going to continue to allow the Trump administration to define the terms of engagement in the society. What is most important for all of us right now, more so than ever, is to reach out like we're doing right now to talk across the artificial boundaries that, that uh, separate uh, the various Abrahamic faiths from each other, that separate the Abrahamic faiths from the non-Abrahamic faiths, that separate the people who are secularists from the people who profess a faith. We have to develop those relationships and we can transform this society. We don't have to be defined by the bad behavior and the bad language that's coming from the top. I, I definitely agree with you in that. I think that eye on the prize is definitely the attitude that we must, you know, have moving forward. But, you know, as much as I want to keep our eyes moving forward, a part of me also questions, you know, what has occurred in our past that has caused this resurgence of white supremacist groups? Why are they reemerging at this current moment? Um. I'm sure I have a definitive answer to that, um, but <laughs> I, I think a lot of it has to do, Iman, with the fact that uh, we're dealing with a, a real fear of change in this country. Uh, so many things are different, even in my lifetime, uh, than they were when I, was, when I was a kid. And all change is difficult. Even change for the good is difficult. I'm sure you've seen on uh, on Facebook or Instagram these listicles that are put up of of things that if you're a certain age you don't remember. What's a typewriter? What's a rotary telephone? 
what's a, a black and white television, all sorts of things like that. Well, we laugh at those things, but the fact of the matter is that when the unfamiliar confronts you, you have a fight or flight uh, reflex that, that needs to be overcome. I would suggest that that's what's going on in, in relations among people in our country these days. Everybody has the idea that we should all get along and all behave as, if not brothers and sisters, at least cousins who sometimes get along better than brothers and sisters. Um, but uh, it's a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing for people who are secure in their way of thinking and believing uh, to acknowledge that what has worked for them hasn't worked for everybody. And that with some small changes that may have an impact on lifestyle, but won't degrade lifestyle, uh, everybody can enjoy the blessings in this country. It's not a zero sum game. And unless we get our heads around that notion that the, the blessings of liberty are vouchsafed to everyone and not just the privileged few, we're going to continue to run into people who will say, why should I make way for anybody else? I've already got what I deserve. You know, I think that that um, moving forward, you're, you're absolutely correct in, in discussing this notion that it should, rights are not only for, you know, the, the privileged few. I, I really appreciate that sentiment. Um, but often, even historically, we have seen certain groups who are um, labeled um, for, for whatever reason as, you know, uh, D dangerous to the norm or, 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 um, or hate, hate, hate groups, much like white supremacists. And, and the, the treatment by, I think, the higher ups, the policymakers, has rarely been very direct in, in, in administering some of these problems. So with the work that your alliance has done, with the experience that you have, what are some of the things that we really need to start incorporating into policy to make sure that these protections are granted for all? Well, first of all, we need to make sure that um, discrimination uh, on the basis of, of religion, on the basis of race, on the basis of uh, gender orientation, that those things are illegal in our society. And when I say illegal, I mean that they need to be treated as the crimes they are, not simply condemned and, and uh, passed over with a wink and a nod. Mm -hmm. um, once we can set that as the standard and incorporate that into the messaging of everything we do, I think we're going to see, make it easier for people to change their minds and hearts. I know that, uh, that sometimes uh, sexual orientation is a difficult question in the Muslim community, but uh, even the most impassioned observer from either side has to be amazed at the transformation that's taken place in this country uh, in terms of its attitudes towards people who are uh, gay or lesbian, that in, in a matter of, of 10 years, people have understood that this is a, a, a natural inclination in humanity and have begun to treat gays and lesbians as the people that they are just of a different perspective. Now, it's going to take a while for longtime traditional religious teachings to catch up with that. And certainly there are cultural norms that have to shift. But even with all that, the willingness of people to see the face of someone that they once relegated to a caricature is what's really important. And once that happens, policy follows right behind. You won't change people's minds and hearts with legislation. You change it with relationships and you change it with good practices. Wonderful. I, I'm in a philosophy course for my master's right now. We're learning about Rawls's view on a veil of ignorance and how many will, you know, adopt this view when, when deciding how to make policy because if you don't know what race you're going to be, what your socioeconomic status would be, you know, what, what privileges you're accumulated to, how would you write policy? And sometimes I wish that this is a persona that we could all take on when, when administering policy because it would create such a fairness and I, I sincerely appreciate your sentiments. I have one final question from the crowd. Sure. Um, and that is for anyone who's looking to get involved with the Interfaith Alliance or support you all in any way, what, what are the steps? 
That's a generous question. So, <laughs> I'll start with the step that will cost the least. Uh, during this uh, awful quarantine, uh, we're trying to make the best of it. And every weekday at 1215 on Facebook Live on the Interfaith Alliance page, we have a 20 minute conversation with someone of note called Stay Home, Stay Focused. Salam was one of my guests uh, in the early, the early weeks of this. And we've, uh, we've got uh, 18 episodes up now. By the end of the month, we'll have closer to, uh, to 30. Um, so come and take a look. It's a good break in the middle of the day. And, and if you're not there at 1215, you can find it on our playlist on YouTube or uh, in the video section of our, of our uh, Facebook page. But if you really want to be involved, join us, uh, interfaithalliance.org. You will find all sorts of information about the advocacy that we're doing there, the education that we're doing there, and the policy proposals that we have. And we would be very glad to accept your support. Um, I know that, uh, I know that uh, uh, giving charitably over the next month is something that is important to Muslims. Uh, I would be very glad to receive your contributions mm -hmm. after you've taken care of the people who are sick and hungry in this, in this crisis. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'm gonna let Salam kind of close, close the gates. Um, but thank you so much, Rabbi Moline. It, it's such a pleasure um, to always have you on and, and hopefully we can have you on again under happier circumstances when the sun is shining again and we can all, you know, enjoy together. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Iman. It's, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. And our next uh, webinar is going to be Monday. We're going to be talking about uh, workers and uh, those exposed to the virus and how we, what we need to do to promote uh, uh, personal protective equipment and and all the, um, all, all the needs that we need to be thinking about for those who are on the front lines. Uh, whereas you and I are, are sheltered in our homes in luxury and yeah. everything is fine, we, we have to think about those people who are on the front lines. They are the, the true heroes. And, and while we're closing the, the doors on this discussion, Jack, I want to thank you for opening the doors <laughs> uh, of, you know, from your thoughtfulness. Uh, and your insight uh, to many of the problems that, that uh, we see every day. But I think you gave us a different angle uh, from which to look at these problems. And, uh, and, and, and in that sense, it's giving us hope. And Salam, I wanna say that there are, there are always going to be issues on which uh, you and I and, and representing the communities that we come from are not going to agree. Most of them are on the other side of the world. But the things that are, are the, the human concerns, the things that uh, are about living together in this country and in this world, um, I don't have a better friend and ally than you. Well, thank you, Jack. I'm, I'm so indebted to, to your friendship uh, and, and uh, looking forward to working with you even further. There you go. Thank you, Rabbi Jack Moline from the Interfaith Alliance. And uh, yeah, go ahead and support Interfaith Alliance. Uh, uh, all we can. It's a great organization and we're again honored to be partners with you. Have a good weekend and Ramadan Kareem. Ramadan uh, Mubarak to you and, and Shabbat Shalom. Thanks. As you uh, enter the, the Sabbath tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.